Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and in this video I'm looking briefly at the Tier 6 American Premium Light Fighter, the Bell P-39N-1 Era Cobra. Hello there, and here on the tarmac outside my hangar is the P-39N-1, an aircraft I have featured twice before in videos. This review will feature all the usual sections, but I'm going to keep my remarks shorter and less detailed than normal. You may want to pause, particularly on the statistics sections, um, and have a look at those numbers for yourself. That said, the last time I reviewed this aircraft was November 2021. The following month, the American 50 cal machine guns were buffed, which has an effect on this plane. It's worth taking a look at the numbers, and that's what we're going to do right now. Here we are with the spreadsheet showing all of the Tier 6 fighters. There are quite a lot of them. I'm just going to scroll sideways briefly. And I'll do that again more slowly in a moment or two so that you can pause the video if you want and have a look at those figures in detail because I'm not going to go through them um, line by line like I would normally. Now, if you don't know how this um, section works, there's a link in the description below to a video that will explain to you how this spreadsheet um, functions. I'm just going to give you my overall opinion immediately. Um, the fun thing about the Aero Cobra is that the um, rating on the guns is the best in class. There is a catch here. Listen out. Although 370 is a splendid DPS and 22 is the best in class, only approached by right at the end the Mustang 1A, you need to note that 92 of that DPS is coming off some 7.62mm or 30 cals, I think, machine guns, and they only become effective at 1,444 feet, which means that anything above that, you're losing 92 DPS. This means that you need to be careful about going into head-ons. This is not a K6 where you can expect to destroy opponents simply by going head-ons on them you still need a little bit of subtlety in your attack vectors on aircraft um, and if they're coming head on at you you may actually want to dodge and avoid avoid and then get behind them rather than try and take them on and blast them out of the sky survivability is pretty ordinary for a light fighter but no worse uh, than many of the other light fighters airspeed is it's got an interesting feature the cruise speed is pretty good but the boost maximum speed is fairly indifferent the boost duration is not high in conjunction with the power to weight ratios at the bottom which are not particularly good i don't see that this aircraft is really suitable for a speed build you may differ on that and i will indicate when i come to show you my build where you might be able to work but the slots the equipment slots or against you for a, a speed build as well in my opinion so i think this aircraft is all about the maneuverability and the first thing you need to know is that there are several aircraft at tier six let alone tier seven that are going to easily outmaneuver you uh, and you can see most of them here all the way up to the spitfires and then you finally find the russian era cobra which is an american plane that was lend leased to the soviets with the same kind of maneuverability the altitude performance it's okay for what I would describe as a term fighter. It's certainly not in the region of high energy fighters. You're going to have to watch out for uh, fighters that can get above you. Rather nastily, the captured Spitfire, the Spitfire VDB 605, is going to be able to get above you and use that against you. Uh, and of course, it can turn pretty viciously as well. And then you've got the normal culprits over here. And this will do as a scroll across. BF 109F, I 210, and the P 51A. Not so much the British Mustangs. Um, they've got inferior engines and not, not particularly good as high altitude fighters. But as you can see, all of this is suggesting to me that this is best built as a term fighter uh, and employed as such. And in fact, I'm going to go a little bit further. Where this aircraft really excels, in my opinion, is on small maps at tier six. It can hold its own at tier 7, but it does struggle to get from sector to sector on larger maps, and that makes it far less effective. If we look at the worst in class figures, and again, I'm just going to hold these here for you and then scroll across so you can see the uh, rest of them. You can see those power to weight ratios are not particularly good, discouraging you from going from a, a speed build. Uh, and you can see that the boost maximum speed is not particularly good either, again, discouraging you from going for a speed build. And let's just scroll across so you can see the other aircraft. And I'll leave you to draw your own conclusions, but as you can hear, pretty firmly in my mind, turn fighter. Okay, let's go and see how I've set the aircraft up in the light of that comment. My P39N-1 is specialised, that means I have all of the equipment and consumable slots available. When you first get the aircraft, you will be missing 
the following. On the airframe, one of the equipment slots, and again on the airframe, one of the consumable slots. Let's see what I've done with it, having put it into specialist configuration again. Now, before we talk about my build, I'll just point out that, uh, unsurprisingly, I've gone for a maneuverability build. You can see your options for a speed build are somewhat limited by the fact that you've only got one engine slot. So you've got to make a choice between an uprated engine. Good cruise speed might lead you to do that. Or you might take the opposite tack and say that the inferior boost speed would leave you to put, lead you to put on a combined injection boost system. And then you'd have the polished skin and probably the lightweight power unit. But if you wanted to build this for speed, you'd really want two slots there. So I think that's another factor discouraging you from going for a speed build. What have I done? Accuracy on the guns. We didn't dwell on it in the previous section. The accuracy is not bad for any of the guns, but it's as well to improve it. So we've got the gun sight. Not really a surprise there. Your alternatives, of course, being uh, cockpit armour and that's probably not appropriate for a light fighter. And then we have the lightweight uh, build components, particularly the lightweight fre wing frame and the lightweight power unit. And then I put on a polished skin just to give me a little bit more speed. If you're really going to concentrate on a maneuverability build, what you might do here is instead put on a reinforced skin. That will probably give you another couple of points of maneuverability. Let's find one and pop it on. And as you can see, you've got another 100, uh, up to 102 there. If you've got an experimental lightweight wing frame or special project equipment for the power unit, you might be able to, under this particular build, and there are effects coming from the pilot, which I haven't discussed yet, you might be able to get that up to 105, I guess. If you go back to the polished skin, so you retain some speed, and I will, so let's just reset it. Then you have to be aware that you're going to lose a little bit of maneuverability if you bring this up to 478 calibration. As you can see, let's just bring up um, the maximum. You'll lose 3.8 your percent maneuver your maneuverability and 3.8 percent maneuverability in terms. I guess that will bring that down to 99 over there. The other items are all fully calibrated. Let's just look at the bonus characteristics quickly. I've gone to improve the accuracy. Basically, I've narrowed the dispersion angle and also wi widened the angle by which you can be off target with the bottom two characteristics there, and then I've gone for some critical damage. Picked off all the bonus characteristics for, ma for maneuverability on the lightweight wing frame. I've picked off the one um, maneuverability characteristic you've got available on the power unit and then gone for a little bit of speed and acceleration. On the polished skin, likewise, I've picked off the two bonus characteristics that will give you more maneuverability and then gone for a bit of cruise speed. On the consumables, we have first aid dressing package. There's no uprated engine in play here. The survivability or resistance to fire is pretty good anyway, so I'm happy with that. If we're in a tight spot, I've used the, I've got the pneumatic control assist to give me 10 seconds of extra maneuverability. I can repair my control surfaces with the emergency control system. Incidentally, with the pilot I've got, there's also the useful skill or perk, if you prefer, where the um, effect of damage to the control surfaces is reduced by 25%. Then we have engine cooling. You're really not going to pursue anything even with extra 10 seconds of boost, but it's better than having an engine restart bottle, I guess. I suppose if you are really concerned about speed, you might think about improved mixture control. Um, and then as soon as I've absorbed some of the gold that I've got, I'll be fitting universal ammunition, which is what I recommend to you, unless you are also going to use gold. Okay, let's discuss pilot skills. I brought up the pilot dialog box and I've briefly switched pilots to a completely unskilled one. I had Elise Clark in the plane in the previous section. We are going to come back to her. The plane is crew trainer. Probably you're going to be putting in another American pilot and uh, that pilot will have skills, but these are the sorts of skills that you'd be looking for. Now, I'm assuming you've got the plane specialized. If you haven't, you might want to swap the next two skills uh, and try them out in the opposite order but with the plane specialized and with a maneuverability build i'd go for aerodynamics expert first follow it with aerobatics expert and then i'd go marksman one and then probably working through battle tested i would then drop battle tested and go into guru one rinse and repeat get up to marksman two rinse and repeat get up to marksman three and then a final rinse and repeat and probably go up for a evasive target if you are 
edging toward inclining us towards a speed build then you can release two skill points by probably dropping aerobatics expert getting through this group just that much quicker and i guess working up to cruise flight as well as probably keeping battle tested the plane however performs best if you put in if you have and ha put in the special pilot to lise clark and let's go and find her she'll be at the top somewhere uh, there she is and as you can see we're back up to maneuverability of 100 which should collapse to 88 the com a completely unskilled pilot and she's of particular benefit to this aircraft because in addition to these two regular skills aerodynamics expert and aerobatics expert there's an extra maneuverability skill uh, the maneuver expert which also applies in giving you another uh, four percent increase in maneuverability as well as giving that that effect um, of, of uh, decreasing the effect of critical damage on control services that get shot away just a quick note her p51d master skill which would be lovely on this plane will not work because it's limited to the p51d okay let's go and have a look at the effects of my choices on the base characteristics of the plane Here we have a spreadsheet showing the effects of the choices I've made on the base figures of the Aero Cobra. Those are in columns C and D. The effects are in columns I and J here because I've got some columns hidden. Uh, in column K, the difference in absolute terms is expressed uh, here. And then in column L, I express the same differences in percentage terms. Now, I'm not going to go through these in detail. Um, so I'm going to leave this here for you. Uh, so you can have a look at the numbers, probably pause the video and see what effects I've got. I'll summarize in a moment. Um, I do have a special skin on the plane, however, it's irrelevant for the base characteristics. That gives you 5% crew um, uh, aircraft experience, which, of course, if the aircraft is specialised and you've ticked accelerate crew training, will become crew experience. So we need to uh, dismiss that from the consideration of the base figures straight away. Now, assuming you've had a look at those figures, let's just scroll down so you can see these figures as well. And let's move up and just summarize the effects. So we've improved the accuracy of the weaponry. You can see the effects there. I'm not going to list them. Um, as ever with the light fighter build of the type I've employed, there are some drawbacks. You lose some hit points. You also lose some damage resistance. Didn't use an uprated engine, so the fire resistance remains at healthy 60. We've even managed to increase, increase the cruise speed from what was already a good 248 miles an hour to 278. So that's a bit of an effect on the speed. The principal effect is, of course, as you can see, the maneuverability gone up from 79 to 100. And... Uh, that will be competitive with most fighters if they are flown by people who aren't quite on top of their turning um, skills. So you might be competitive with people who don't turn their Japanese aircraft as well as they should. If you find one that does, then you'll need to use slash and burn techniques. A little bit of an increase in the climb rate. This is not going to bother us. It's only three feet per second. OK, so I hope you've seen all those figures. As I say, make sure you pause the video to, so that you can have a look at them. And we'll move on to uh, the next section, which is going to be how the aircraft performed in battle. Here we are on Scorching Sands. It's the invasion variant. And this is exactly the kind of map on which the Aero Cobra can excel. It's small, five sectors. And in the right sort of game, you can reap some hefty rewards, as you're about to see. Very briefly... You need to try and hold your local garrison, which will probably get captured by the enemy at least once for longer than the enemy holds their local garrison. You need to try and hold one of the air bases. And normally, from the perspective of the blue point, it's the one off to the right. Uh, and then you need to try and hold the middle garrison for longer than the enemy as well. Typically, these games can be quite fluid on the order of battle. I'm going to summarise by saying it's actually pretty well balanced. If anything, we've got a slight advantage because we have Mr. Wibbles in um, uh, an ME410 and the enemy doesn't have a heavy. However, they do have a P40. And I could see this battle going either way, depending on how the players played. So having said that, let's get into that battle. As we begin the battle, this is a natively recorded replay file. You'll see me looking around and zooming in to use sniper mode. There's only one place we can go at the start of the battle. That's to the local garrison right in front of us. And then, as is my usual practice on this map, I will break right to go to the uh, airbase. So looking around for the first air defence aircraft, ignoring the heavies above me, going straight for this boomerang. 
and using that firepower to great effect on tier 6 ADAs. And we've already captured it. Unsurprisingly, the enemy's already got theirs, that's typical, and now we're off to that airbase. It's going to be a hallmark, a hallmark of this battle. Um, it's going to be a very fluid battle, which goes the full distance. And this is not only the map and the t battle tier that suits this plane, but if you want a really impressive score, you'll want teams that are balanced and duke it out right until the end. Found the boomerangs defending the air, air, air base. Take out the first one. We can swap on to the next one. And for those of you who don't know, I've got a key binding which allows me to select the nearest target and it toggles through the next nearest and the next nearest and the next nearest. So as soon as I've destroyed something, I press that key binding. Lock nearest target. And that tells me which way to turn in the turn fight. It gives me just a, I don't know, something between a quarter and a half second advantage on somebody who's having to look around for his next target, I guess. So we've cleared out um, everything at the airbase. Good practice to pick up repairs. Now, unfortunately, the maintenance shed is destroyed. We'll have a quick look at the tactical situation. Maintenance shed comes back in as the airbase unlocks, pick up the repairs, and we can see that there's a bun fight in the middle. Um, these two teams have both achieved their initial objectives, taking their local garrison and also one of the air bases. Now the drawback here is the enemy seems to be further advanced in taking this central location. We can finish off this uh, ground attacker, but unfortunately they managed to flip the sector before I can do that. I need to take out this dangerous Japanese fighter. Fortunately it melts under the weaponry. Concentrate on the more dangerous fighter. Easily out the move with the Fokker Wolf. Which in any, in any case chose to fly away. Now is turned conveniently into the hail of bullets that I'm firing at him. Now we set about trying to take this sector. All the while we've got to keep an eye on the fact that the enemy may have managed to sneak its bombs and ground attackers across to our local garrison. In fact if you look at the minimap right now you can see that there are two aircraft over there although one of them's a heavy. And temporarily we're falling up. We've managed to take their local garrison. Things are beginning to look good. Don't need repairs. Now, looking off to the left here, I probably should have spotted they were about to take our airbase, and I should have gone there. But instead, because I'm aware that the enemy tends to take the local garrison, and it's a, a nuisance having to then go and have to retake it, I chose to go there uh, and defend it. Found a ground attacker here. Begin to manoeuvre so I can pile more shots into it. And they have now got both air bases. Now this is fairly unusual in this battle. Then goes the Junkers. Okay, we're still three sectors to one up at the moment. But now we've got no easy spawn point. Go after the P-47. Destroy that. Rocker Wolf looks to be next on my list. And that goes as well. And I really ought to be trying to get in and try and capture one of these air bases. So we go back to the one that we captured originally. Spot one of the enemy team coming out. Oh, the tornado full of holes. Destroy that as well. And now we're three two down. And having both air bases just gives the enemy the option to get to sectors quicker than we can, so we really need one of these back. So go for the bow fighters, they're both together, which means I can shoot them both down quite easily. And that secures the airbase. Now it's time to turn our attention to another sector. Or we'll deal with any incoming threats. You can see the lag um, three over there doesn't appear to be aware of me. 
destroy that at long distance. Some good shooting there, actually. Good lead. And looks like we're going to lose the middle. And as you can see now, this is a very fluid battle. The two teams, for once, were very evenly matched. Now, we have managed to defend this, but I can see that our local garrison is under threat again. So I'm heading there, shooting down what's in the way as I go along. Making sure that I don't get shot from behind whilst I'm trying to take out this ground attacker. And I was lucky that this heavy chose to go for our ME410 rather than me. And it gets the ME410. That actually is quite critical. But I get him. But it now means that uh, the enemy's got free play at altitude over any sector for 30 seconds or so. I have to avoid this tornado. Get on its tail. I'm getting caught between thinking about our local garrison and the central garrison. We've lost the central garrison. And now we've lost the local garrison as well. So I don't know what's going on here. It feels like just at this part of the game, I'm the only member of my team shooting aircraft down. And now I have to stay here and retake it. And this is where I get taken out of the battle, of course, because I'm over in a corner of the map. The enemy gets free play over the other four sectors whilst I'm far away from all of them. So the ADA spawn. Not as near to me as I would have liked. Nevertheless, I get straight onto a, a boomerang. The Winged Legend went through a moment or two ago, and now you see the Ace has gone through. I've been really busy in this battle. Get into another boomerang. As you can see, we're 4-1 down, and the enemy is about to take the lead. Get onto a bow fighter, and of course this weaponry demolishes ADAs at tier 6. But we need another sector, even though we've now taken this one. And again, our airbase is under threat, and I need some health for the final phase of this battle. So my thinking here was to make sure that the ground attacker couldn't take this um, airbase and then try and get repairs. Here the sky has gone through. And in retrospect, I may have made the wrong decision here. I perhaps should have gone and mixed it in the middle and tried to shoot down enemy aircraft. For a start, I don't get rid of the Junkers at 87 as quickly as possible, and secondly, the uh, repair base, the maintenance shed, is actually destroyed. And that holds me up whilst I'm looking at it. Now, we have actually taken the centre, and there are things to do here. So I'm still feeling pretty confident at this stage. Take out the Pop Wolf. But you can see from that... We're just beginning to run out of aircraft, and at this stage of the battle, with a finely balanced game, that's not a good thing. I still can't get repairs. Lose the centre again. And we're one aircraft down. and the enemy has now got an advantageous position. A spot that the maintenance shed, or feel more likely that the maintenance shed will be back in, after having been down for two minutes, and I get my repairs. And I felt that I needed full health for this final phase against the enemy, where they had the extra aircraft. It's actually worse than that. They've managed to shoot down two of our aircraft without losing any of their own, and now there's only two of us against the rest of the um, enemy team, five. Nevertheless, I do what I need to do. I get towards them, they're all flying together, and I'm hoping to be able to surprise them, knock them down very rapidly, perhaps get into a better position. The Ascender's the big threat as far as I'm concerned, fortunately he flies across me at half health, he goes down. One of the other enemies is not paying me attention, so the P-40 also succumbs, that goes gives me the Kosha dub above me, I've got uh, another enemy aircraft, I shoot that down, but I just run out of time. I just don't have time to take down the enemies. I could have got the two bots. It's a heartbreaking defeat.
Let's have a look at the outcome of this battle, and we can see from the centre it's a 5 chevron battle, or a grade 1 fighter if you prefer. That grossed 183,252 credits, of which just over 61,000 came from a premium account bonus. We look in the message box, something slightly odd here. I've got 2,000 power credits worth of repair costs, and I'm not quite sure where they've come from. No expenses for consumables. I was using prepaid consumables, that is, I'd uh, bought them previously in a half price sale. If we move on to 1,958 experience, of which the base is 1,224, premium count bonus 612, 122 coming from other bonuses there, 97 free experience, uh, that's 67 base, 30 uh, coming from a premium count bonus, a couple of tokens here, the Kosher Dub and the Ace. However, we can also see up here that there's an Akamatsu, a Winged Legend, and a Hero of the Sky Badge. On the Personal Score tab, we can see that all of the class-specific missions are complete, um, hence an easy five chevrons. Personal points, 25,060. Five sectors captured, very busy. 28 aerial targets destroyed. 6,878 damage to aerial targets with 28 criticals coming off that 37mm cannon. And here's the curiosity about the repair costs. I didn't lose the aircraft, so where are the repair costs? Maybe there's something new in the game that I've yet to learn here. Capture points, 820, which is split 480 for defending, 340 for attacking. Team score tab, unsurprisingly, enough for first place, both by personal points and chevrons. Uh, that would have been on both teams. Some pretty decent con contributions here from Mr. Wibbles in his Mosquito. Very nearly a winged legend there. And the B-17G, um, contributing 8,000 as well. The enemy side, just slightly more consistent. And we ran out of aircraft at the end. And unfortunately, despite a fairly intense effort by myself, we ended up losing this battle. That brings me to the end of the review of the P-39N-1, and to sum up, this plane features massive firepower for a Tier 6 light fighter, but it's slow and fairly limited. On small maps, it can have a major impact. On larger maps, and those will be the ones that you're fighting on most usually, and often at Tier 7, its effect will be much diminished. Well, I hope you found that useful, and that if you did, you'll come and see my future content. Stick around, there's a bonus battle coming up, a win this time, but this is where I leave you. So I'm the Noble Cube, signing out.